So um, now we're going to bring all, all the panelists back together. Um, and if you do have a question for any of the panelists, please just um, put it into the chat of the Q&A now and we'll, we'll get started. So if we'll get everyone back together. Before we actually start with the questions, I want to go back to something that uh, Emma posed at the start, which was uh, kind of a compliment from the last week. I didn't think we heard any of them. So I think it's important that we go back. Um, I'll read a couple of them out if I can find them back in the chat here. So, um, so some of the compliments people have had. Yesterday, a year of people stayed behind to give me a packet of timeout biscuits. She said she'd remembered. I'd said, um, I like them. So when she saw them, she thought of me and brought them absolutely made my ear. It's lovely. A thank you card and a box of sweets from a parent for taking five minutes to talk to her anxious daughter. Little did she know that taking the five minutes, this, uh, talking to the student, was what I needed to de-stress de myself and catch a breath, win-win. Um, a student from last year saying she misses my classes. Um, my kids enjoyed and complimented the dinner I cooked. Just like simple little victories here. Um, uh, people said how they felt that I made them feel important, how they felt that I made them feel important. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen. And that wasn't from a teacher, or wasn't from a kid, it was from another teacher. Um, and a student shared something concerning, and I was able to share this with her head of year and get her help. So it is like, Emma, I was so shocked when you posed that, how difficult that is to do I could name 10 things that have annoyed me or upset me in the past year but just just one little thing that made me feel good from another person it's so why is that so difficult I think it comes back to the negativity bias I think we're, we're so quick to hold on to the things that have aggravated or annoyed or offended us um and we are we're not we're wired to survive wired to survive in the short term. We're not wired to be happy in the long term. So we have to do something about it. So whether it's, and these are, again, they don't cost anything. They're really quick. Whether it's every meeting in a school, having just two minutes at the beginning where people share something positive that's happened that week, or in your classroom, just getting children to end the day with, with a blessing or a post-it note, or the week if, if, if it's too much to do it every single day. And it's just, and it sounds cheesy, doesn't it? And when, when we wrote about June and I, when we did our things, we nearly didn't include it in the book. So, oh, come on, every, you know, everyone knows this. But actually people need reminding. Uh, people just need reminding. Uh, and, and actually of all the different strategies we share, the three good things activity is by far the most popular. Maybe because it's easy, maybe because it's an excuse to buy a new notebook and put it by the bed. Um, may, but whatever reason, uh, just that that act of, of just holding on, capturing, capturing the positives and working through and letting go of this is so important. There's a really nice way, just, just coming on to that, about catching the positives. I've seen in schools, notice boards, you know, and because as educational psychologists, we would be in and out of schools all the time and notice boards for staff. You just put little bit, you kind of posters up saying, thank you for doing this, or it was great that you helped me with this. And that's when you walk into a school, you auto automatically already feel that this school really focuses on staff well-being and that the staff really appreciate each other. Just little things like that can make a big difference, not only to your visitors coming in, but to the staff themselves, that it's, it's part of that culture that they really believe on, on staff well-being because it's right out there in the centre. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, the, the, the notice boards are good. Um, the, I find a lot of people, like even more, the kind of private notes in their, in their pigeonholes, just encouraging people to leave a private note. Some staff shy from public praise, and I think when, when schools with the best intentions start moving towards certificates for staff or grand thank yous in staff briefing, um, a lot of stuff find very difficult. So, so well, I suppose it comes back to that. Not everything works for everybody, but uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the yeah, in the Google coaching program, they also highlight the idea of sharing bright spots. They call it, and it is that idea of when you're going through the challenges, you know, having the the idea of sharing something positive. You know, perhaps a nice comment that the a parent has sent in. Something like that just gives you the momentum to keep going, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think it's, it's partly as well taking a bit of uh, our own agency and responsibility for creating the culture uh, of not only looking out for the positives, but looking out for opportunities to speak positives to others. Um, do you have a culture in Northern Ireland that tends to, uh, mm. uh, we enjoy banter, don't we? We enjoy the crack, which very often means slagging other people off. <laughs> But, um, and that's, that, I think that's part of the de-stress. That's part of how we cope with things here. But at the same time, taking those opportunities, I, had a, I saw a colleague um, 
earlier on, uh, or just towards the end of last week, did something that really impressed me, really, really impressed me. So I went to him the next day and said, I'm, I'm probably going to make you feel a little bit awkward now, because I know you don't like it whenever people say nice things to you, but it was done just between him and me. And I just told him, but I told him in, in detail, I said, look, this, this is what I saw, and this is why I really appreciated what you did. And he probably squirmed a bit at the time, but I'm quite sure that he went away afterwards just thinking, Oh, it was nice that somebody took the time. So we, we get opportunities every single day to do that, don't we? Um, yeah, and how many yeah, times that's, we, we not that's, take that's true, Alistair. I think like the, the thank yous are so important because they build that sense of connection as well and staff that you know that you took the time to go and thank and thank that member of staff and acknowledge what, what they had done. It's it's huge because it makes that person feel more connected to that organization as well, which is very important. And um, Jen just in the chat was saying at home we do a highlight of the week at Sunday dinner. So it's like a lovely way of sort of milestone of the week or whatever um yeah I was just um I was interested in because we're talking about um I think everyone touched on something around like clear communication and you know during the pandemic we're we're so isolated and it seems to be a lot of it's about how we can get those connections again how we can get honest um, communication or um what do you think that the teacher and pupil relationship will have changed because of the pandemic in terms of even as we were talking about peer assessments and the feedback loop and is there going to be a long-term change in how teachers and pupils interact whether that's in a well-being way or or in, in other ways like that yeah well i think if we're open to learn david uh, i mean I, I talk a lot about um redeeming these circumstances the circumstances are what they are you know we we are swept along by them but the thing that we have at least a degree of agency in is how we respond to them. Um, and it's definitely caused me to reflect an awful lot more on the centrality of pupil well-being. In fact, a, a very simple thing that I'm realizing now that um, whenever we're coming up to our first tracking point in school, so it means that dear pupils are just being assessed left, right and center. Uh, so I'm trying to think, how, how do you take a little bit of pressure off them, right? Knowing the pressure they've been on, because a lot of the communication over the last 18 months when they've been using Google Classroom is what we use or, or Teams or whatever you would use to send those private messages where pupils that maybe are a little bit quieter than normal would, would talk and maybe open up a little bit more about how they're feeling. So I thought, you know, typically whenever I'm a test is coming up, it'll be, right, I've gotten in my mind those students that I think uh, they're definitely the ones that aren't going to work. So I need to give a clear message to them. <laughs> you better work hard for this. And, and then I reflected, actually, they're probably the ones that sit in the class going, I don't care. And the ones that that does affect are the conscientious ones that I'm not actually speaking to who go, oh, well, Mr. Hamill says this is really, really important. So I've actually switched it round. And now I find myself earlier this week saying, you know, you've, to just yesterday, actually, to year 11, you're doing a test today. I said, look, I, I don't want you to sit in your, your bedroom tonight. Tonight, That was in last night, sitting, worrying, panicking about this. Um, I don't want you, this is your first test. I don't want you to think, oh, I've got to really make a very good impression. No, I want you to work. Of course, I want you to work. But you've already made a good impression. Um, and if this test goes and go well, well, I didn't use the language of the feedback loop, but that's the whole notion of it. You know, I, I get that information. I, I can support them. So I suppose for me, it's about looking at how I have learned, even like 30 years in, <laughs> how I've learned um, the importance of, of how I speak to the young people and the message that I get across and just supporting that. Uh, I definitely want to hold on to that, David. Mm-hmm. I think there's definitely more focus now on emotional well-being, which is something I'm not sure that we had a huge um, spotlight on beforehand. But certainly with COVID-19, it's in the media so much more. And as as, as you said, um, sometimes it's it's too much to kind of go, oh, you know, well-being kind of loses its, the, the importance of its meaning. But I do think that people are a lot more aware of what it is now. And if we're more aware as teachers, you know, about our own emotional well-being and how to try to manage that, then that will have a positive impact on our children and young people. And as you say, Alistair, being open and honest, you know, with our young children, I think it's okay if you say that you're having a bad day as a teacher. That's okay. You know, we're only human at the end of the day. And it's really, really assuring for children and young people to know, oh, teachers have bad days as well. Or, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I've made a mistake. All those things are good for our children and young people to learn about, you know, how to navigate life. I just think, I mean, for children and for adults, I think the most damaging message is that business as usual message that, right, let's get back, let's let's, let's carry on. And, and, and I have spoken to teachers and leaders whose performance appraisals, whose performance appraisals in September this month have been all about 
how they've set assessments, how they adopt assessments, how they develop the curriculum with no reference whatsoever to lessons learned from COVID. And I just think, and I'm not saying, you know, we wallow in self-pity. I just think we, we, we had, we have a unique and really quite special opportunity to learn some lessons about what education is. And those, you know, that Alistair referred to, those, those, the dreaded GCSE countdowns, you know, the way we, we address everything to a certain set of lazy boys in these assemblies and the countdowns. And actually, on a serious note, the students we end up with in my pupil referral unit are often those who have become paralyzed with anxiety because they're the ones who've been hearing those messages of stop being lazy, stop being lazy. Yep. GCSEs mean everything. GCSEs mean the world. And, and, yet, and yet, when we looked at the compliments and the achievements at the top of that chat, how many people said, oh, well, one of my year 10s got a grade eight in his, you know, us, none of them. They were all about relationships. They were all about human connection. So, so yeah. Here, here. Um, so I, again, just a reminder: if you want to, if you want a question for the panel, just pop it into the chat. We had one there um, from Anna. I think for Alistair. Alistair, would you be willing to share your bring your own device policy? We're we're taking tentative steps towards this. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll maybe just type in my C2K email address in the chat and, and you can email that through to me. I'll speak to our ICT coordinator. Um, it, it is all based on a relationship of trust. Uh, and, you know, I suppose it's, it spills over from that notion of what we've been talking about with relationship here. But what I would say is that for a lot of the last 18 months, we've been interacting with our young people via technology. Um, and not every school, but a lot of schools were, were doing some form of live stream at some stage. And there was a relationship of trust there. And I think this is an opportunity for us moving forward. Look, I know that mobile phones in, in schools are a massive issue, safeguarding, discipline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's any number of very, very reasonable um, reasons not to use them. Um, but again, is, is there just not a, an opportunity here? I mean, we've had that trust, we've had that perhaps enhanced relationship. Um, you know, and if we can build on that and let the young people realize actually, you know, that this is going to make your learning process better, it's going to help me to help you better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, now the policy itself will go into a, a lot of the details of uh, what we get them to sign up for and things like that, but that, that's probably just helpful to say as a foundation to it all. Um, uh, Danielle Gareth just asked, how do we get signed up for Google Certified Trainer Coach for CPD? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Google, Google. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly, if you go, um, if you go on to Google and you Google the Google Certified Trainer Program, is that what what Gareth is asking? Is Gareth asking how yeah. do you become Just, a trainer? Uh, um, how do, how do we get signed up for Google yeah. Certified Trainer? Yeah programs yes and it's all free Gareth and you literally go on there there's um onto the the Google for Education website so if you go to Google for Education you'll see that there's different programs there's um certification programs of for example the Google certified educators that you can take your staff through and um, you can also go on to there and you'll see that there's the programs and the programs is where the trainer and the coach lives and it's all free and the coaching curriculum is completely free so you can go in there delve down through all of the the different modules if it's really just a sense of it that you want rather than actually applying for it but I, I absolutely think that you should apply for it if it's something you're interested in. Um, now, it's really very American in nature when you read through it. It's talking about, um, you know, uh, instructional coaching. And in America, the instructional coaches are full time um, people. So we have to adapt it for Northern Ireland here. And, you know, really, we wouldn't have time to do everything that they advocate there. But there's so much to learn from that curriculum and it's just sitting there it's free and it's really worthwhile to go down through it um is that all online or is it in person or how does it work yes all completely online although if you go on we have um different networks for educators called the the global google educators and if you go on there you will see and um, there's different coaching programs so um if you go onto my twitter as well you'll see links to those so i went in um to global Google educator groups over in America and join them. And there's a team of about 10, 15 of us. And we all work together um, to, to help ourselves go through the program and 
basically talked about um, different ideas and challenges that we had and we all met through Google Meet. So there are lots of little grassroots groups that um, you can um, meet with to go through the programme. And I would love to meet with any of you, Garth, if you're interested. I would love to meet up and um, talk through it all. And anybody else is interested, um, we could definitely um, organise that. Um, that's great. So David. Oh, David, yeah. would you would you mind if I ask Daniel a quick question of the? Oh bank? yes, of course. <laughs> Daniel, um, I, coaching is brilliant, and I, I love the whole notion of um, helping people to be able to self reflect. But you talk about the time, yes, that that, that yes. takes to do properly. Um, and and there have been times whenever I've tried the coaching thing where it's just taking them too long to get it, and I think the the bell's about to go. I'm just going to have to tell you the answer. <laughs> um, so how how do you carve out the time to do that meaningfully? Yeah, it, there's no doubt the time is the biggest challenge to it all. But um, really, you know, it is so worthwhile. And if you look at the research behind it that shows you the impact that it can have, you, you just have to make the time and um, you sometimes have to bring people together in a group if they're they're meeting a similar challenge and work with them but all coaching doesn't have to be long sessions sometimes it can be just a 15 minute quick meet and um, sometimes coaching can just be you saying to the person come into my classroom I'm going to be doing that very thing mm -hmm. next Wednesday at this time come in and um, Sometimes you do have to be dedicated to it and carve the time out. And in the school development plan, we're doing that at the minute. We are making the time for it because we know it's so impactful. And we're um, part of our directed time, then we will dedicate to it. Um, so it really is that it's if you feel it's valuable, you will find the time for it. Um, also, Dr. Emma, I'd like to give um, Dr. Emma Kiel another wee shout out for that programme that they're doing. It's called is it Outside Associates is now the, the group that you're working on. And um, again, there, there's great work being done over there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, just I mean, I, always an opportunity to bang the drum for coaching. Just that that thing about time. I'm working with a number of head teachers or school principals. I encourage them to have their coaching during the day, during the school week. So they put the sign on the door and they take their hour and it's a, and they're doing it. They're doing it. I mean, it, you know, it's it's hard, isn't it? It's that thing of don't say your doors always, always open because it's not. Uh, and they make that time and the impact that's having on them and, and their their well-being and, and their performance in work, I think, is huge. So um, we're just running out of time, but I just want to open it up. It, does anyone have any final thoughts on, on health and well-being and, and things to consider? Um, moving into, I suppose, within this next academic year. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in with something quickly, David. I, I thought whether or not to put this into uh, the presentation, but I was hoping a chance would come up at this at the end. Um, I don't know if anybody plays fantasy football or not, but you know the notion of fantasy football, you can pick your dream team. Um, there's another thing that I think is really important in all of this. Um, surrounding your people, yourself with people that bring positive energy to you. Um, I'm a great believer in coping with busyness, not necessarily by not necessarily cutting out the busy. The busyness is inevitable, mm -hmm. but it's finding the things that in the midst of the busyness add energy and positivity to you. Uh, and one of the things I definitely want to keep from this is the ability to connect with like minded colleagues, irrespective of whether they're in my school or not. I'm delighted to be presenting with with Danielle tonight. Um, she's just an inspirational colleague who I've never actually met, <laughs> but I just see the work that she does, uh, and it's just she brings such a positivity and such creative thinking to the education community in Northern Ireland. Um, and you're definitely in my my dream team, Danielle, in terms of people that that bring that positivity in. And th there's just opportunities now for us folks um, across. Uh, um, things like this and Zoom calls and everything like that for us to connect with like-minded people who will bring that energy and positivity to you. So take those opportunities too beyond your own school. Yeah, any, any other final thoughts just from anyone else before we, we wrap up? Just to kind of follow on with what Alice just said, I mean, there is more, you know, lots more opportunities now because we can work remotely and um, that's going to be one of the main areas of the of our well-being project for staff because we're going to be able to work across Northern Ireland and we're hoping to create cluster groups as well so that staff can come together and share those ideas because that's where a lot of the, the, the brilliant ideas come from is just the opportunity to get together and, and talk about what works in your school and, and what hasn't worked and building those successes. 
Okay. Well, um, I think that's all we have time for tonight. So um, thank you so much. We're um, just a reminder that you can watch this talk back again, be up on the BBC Northern Ireland YouTube page, uh, probably by the end of the week or maybe by the start of next week. Um, and please do join us tomorrow night um, where we'll be focusing on how COVID-19 has impacted education here and how it might shape learning in the future. So I just want to finish with a comment from Gabrielle. My, fav my favourite gift as a teacher was when a parent sent me a letter um, thanking me for what I did for a child, way better than a candle or body lotion. So, um, so thanks, Jack Gabrielle. And thank you to all our panellists, Dr. Emma Kell, Dr. Uh, Carol Stratton, Alistair Hamill, and Danielle McKernan. And thank you all for watching and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night.